very much, Angelus. Uh, thank you for interrupting your vacations to come to the class tonight. Uh, when the class is over, you may resume your summer. Um, uh, sometimes I fall asleep dreaming that I'm giving a talk on Frank Lloyd Wright only to wake up and find out that I really am. <laughs> Uh, the title of tonight's talk is Right Here, Right Now, question mark, and I hope that by the time we're finished, I will have answered most of the questions that relate to Frank Lloyd Wright in La Jolla, Frank Lloyd Wright in San Diego. One of the things that uh, uh, interested me about tonight is it's, uh, the title of the whole series is Architects making history, contemporary architects making history. And uh, I'm going to begin by being a little contrary because if there was any architect who was especially gifted in making history, it was Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, he was a master at, at making history. And, and I, when I was interviewed by the uh, La Jolla Light for this uh, little introduction to this program, um, the gentleman asked me what I, how I would characterize my approach, and I told him that if we looked at it as if it was a time machine, H.G. Wells' time machine, and uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was, in fact, while he was living, and most of us are able to live in our own little time machine, we can go back and make little adjustments to the things that we wanted to change in the record. And so when one of us, a historian, wants to go back, we have to create our own time machine. And we have to go back and try to find the details that either prove what that history is, or that biography, or that autobiography, or disprove it. And I'm going to give you an example right now. This is the Victoria Hotel. It was designed in Lewis Sullivan's office by Frank Lloyd Wright in 18... 93 or uh, late 1892. Now, the reason this is significant is that uh, Frank Lloyd Wright in his autobiography uh, said that he was fired by Sullivan for moonlighting and uh, uh, creating uh, commissions on his own outside the office. Well, if you look at that uh, in terms of a pro professional environment, that is undesirable for an employee to be moonlighting. But I was wondering if it would be that a really talented, gifted employee would be fired for something like that. He probably would be given a raise. So how does the Victoria Hotel figure into this? Well, Wright was, was fired in 1893. He was working on the Victoria Hotel in Sullivan's office, the office of Adler and Sullivan. When he left the office, he immediately took up a commission, which is the famous Winslow House, one of his first great classic houses. And if you uh, look at the upper story of the Victoria Hotel, now I, I, can, I hear some laughter there. What I've done is I've taken a, a silhouette of a, a portion of the Victoria. Now you go to the Winslow House. Now this photograph, I've, I've manipulated, it's backwards. But what I wanted to depict for you is the frieze on the upper story of the house, the roof overhang, and the little uh, pop out on the, uh, on the end of the building, the little um, uh, bay window. And if you look at the Victoria at the second floor, you see the same treatment. Well, this was the first thing that told me that, well, maybe there was something more to this story than Frank Lloyd Wright was relating. I contacted uh, Grant, Manson, Grant Carpenter Manson, who wrote a uh, signal uh, book about Frank Lloyd Wright called Frank Lloyd Wright, The Golden Years to 1910, published in the 1950s. And I talked with him. and. Uh, I described to him the other feature of this commission that uh, I found intriguing. Now this is the Victoria Hotel as built. This was built after Wright left Sullivan. This is the stable at the Winslow House that Wright designed uh, for his first client, 
This is his, one of his first jobs. If you look, you see the, the program for the exterior facade of this hotel is compressed, is compressed into what I think is the stable. Now, believe me, here I think you have an issue. If Sullivan found a sketch by Wright of a client's work, and incidentally Winslow was a Sullivan client for a commercial building, that would be grounds for being fired. So I'm in the time machine. I'm going back and I'm trying to find, discover the things that are the truth about what happened. And nobody will ever know the truth. It's a tease. It's seductive, and for me, it's the Victoria's Secret. <laughs> this is a photograph of Adler and Sullivan. Sullivan is on the left. Their uh, great building at the World's Columbian Exposition in uh, Chicago, 1893, was the transportation building. This facade, incidentally, I believe, was incorporated into what was the Cabrillo Theater down in uh, central downtown San Diego uh, around the time of the uh, Panama Exposition. Now this is right about this time when he had uh, broken away on his own. Another individual who was in the office at the time was Irving Gill. And so uh, he may well have known the story about this uh, there is no record of it. But what's interesting is that, that Gill, when he came to San Diego, linked up again with Lloyd Wright, Frank Lloyd Wright's son. And uh, this was the first time that the Wrights came to San Diego, and there was a reason for this. This was in 1911 and 1912, the summer of 1911 and 12. Lloyd came to San Diego to work with the Olmsted brothers on Balboa Park for the Panamanian Exposition. His brother John traveled west hoping that he would also get a job related to the uh, activity down in San Diego at that time. Frank Lloyd Wright was going through a separation with his first wife, Catherine, and so he was uh, in a situation where he was attempting to uh, get the children out of the house so that he could negotiate with his wife. And so he bought round trip train tickets for son David and daughter Catherine. And they, they came west and the, the basis for that trip was that they were to come to San Diego by train, they were to get employment and work for the summer, and then they'd use the return fare to go back to Chicago. If they didn't get a job, they could use the train ticket to go back to Chicago. So at that time, there were four rights in San Diego, and that's the summer of 1911 and 1912, and they were staying at a, an apartment uh, in the 1200 block of Front Street in Hillcrest. It was, I don't think it was called Hillcrest at that time. That was Lloyd. That, that's Lloyd just a couple of years. Uh, this would have been when he was about 19 years old. And David worked on the uh, landscape for, that you see right here. He watered the landscape here below the Cabrillo Bridge construction. The, the Cabrillo Bridge construction is a little bit, was a little bit uh, less complete when he was there. It was more like the footings of the bridge and so forth. And uh, Lloyd worked with Irving Gill and this was the building they worked in. And I think, maybe somebody would want to correct me, I think Gill designed that building. And uh, there was a time when Gill was going to design the whole fair and, and unfortunately uh, that didn't happen. Um, and Lloyd was working with the Olmsteads there became a, there was a, a divisive issue having to do with the way the park was going to be built for the exposition. And uh, the Olmsteads wanted the primary structures to be built at the south end of the park. 
And the commercial interest in San Diego wanted the buildings to be built in the middle of the park where they are now. And so the Olmsteads resigned their commission and Lloyd uh, also left uh, the staff and, and uh, went to Los Angeles to work with a landscape architect. This is one of the commissions that is alleged to have been for a project in San Diego for Frank Lloyd Wright. It's a cinema. And Wright was uh, very mischievous in his making records in his office. And he was constantly changing dates on drawings so that it looked like he had, a, uh, had, had established a, a certain creative direction earlier than he actually did. And um, this is one of those cases. The, the date on this drawing was 1905. But it's, it's only recently been discovered by Bruce Brooks Pfeiffer, the archivist at Telly S. and West, Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation, that this building probably was designed in 1915, and it was probably designed as a theater to be built for the Panamanian Exposition. It was going to be downtown, but it would be for that event. The reason that, they, that he dates it that way is that these finials here <coughs> appear on Midway Gardens in Chicago, which was built in 1915. So that's one project that Wright designed for San Diego, uh, but there are hardly any records about it other than the drawing. After this, Wright got a commission to go to Japan and to design the Imperial Hotel. His son John joined him. Uh, John had, had worked briefly with uh, Harrison Albright, San Diego architect, and John designed a house that was built in Escondido in 1912, and it still uh, stands in Escondido. It's uh, actually his first commission. He was not yet an architect when he uh, designed and built that project. He joined his father in Japan, and this commission took Wright out of the country for about five years. During that time, Rudolf Schindler came into the United States and he wanted to uh, work with Frank Lloyd Wright. And so he, he uh, early on, he rented a room in what now is the apartment building that the first Frank Lloyd Wright family, uh, the, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, his wife Catherine, and their six children lived in this house. It was called the Home and Studio. And then in 1911, when uh, the, the uh, Wright uh, separated from his wife, uh, he subdivided the house from the studio so that she would live with the family in the studio side and they would rent the house. In order to get that all done, he hired Rudolf Schindler to do the conversion. And so uh, the conversion of the residence, home and studio into an apartment building was managed by Schindler. While the work was going on, Wright's sister, Jane Porter and her husband, Andrew, bought the Hurtley house, which is only three houses away from the home and studio. And Wright's mother, Anna, was living with them in the Hurtley house. And Anna was sending regular messages to her son in Japan, telling him about how Rudolf Schindler was having these wild parties <laughs> and the, the lights were on late at night and nothing was going on that was improving the house at all. And interestingly enough, this gives you a little bit of an insight in the women in Wright's life, because most of them found that in order to be appreciated by him, they had to be helping him in, in any way possible. And in many cases, they were uh, sort of the, the uh, spy looking in on, on things. Of course, the information wasn't always very accurate. OK, so Schindler worked on the home and studio, and he had free rent while he was doing it. So Anna insisted that that's the reason it took so long to do the remodel. In 1928, Wright had finished the Imperial Hotel. He was now back in the country. He had a very tumultuous relationship with uh, the woman who was his mistress and then became his second wife after Catherine gave him the divorce that he wanted. And then after marrying the mistress that he had been uh, 
in a relationship with for nine years, they separated after four months. <laughs> and so then Wright was trying to divorce her, and he met Olga Vanna, his third wife. And so uh, it's, it is uh, kind of a, a well-known detail of his life that he came here to San Diego to escape all the publicity in the Midwest when he wanted to actually marry Olga Vanna. He got a divorce from Miriam Knoll, his second wife, and uh, they stayed, uh, Olga Vanna and Frank, and this is going to be hard to identify. I, I put a little marker on this map, but unfortunately it's hard to see. Uh, I think that's Westbourne there. Uh, they stayed in a rental on Westbourne. And what makes it interesting is, now this is 1928, and Rudolf Schindler was building Pueblo Ribera, <coughs> which is only about four blocks walking from the apartment that Wright had. And it's, it is very intriguing when you have uh, immersed yourself in Wright's, the details of Wright's life, as have I, when you recognize that he never passed up any opportunity to look in on what his competition was doing. And so uh, they, they lived in the apartment here, and then they, get, they uh, traveled to Rancho Santa Fe for the marriage ceremony, and then they left after that to go back to Wisconsin. Miriam Knoll had come while they were uh, uh, in the uh, process of getting married and trashed the apartment. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, uh, Wright received a sympathetic letter from his landlord when he got back to Wisconsin and said, uh, thank you for making everything right by giving us those splendid Japanese prints. Wright never would part with a dollar if he could part with anything else, including uh, a sketch or something. And this is Pueblo Rivera, which is uh, still being maintained and is still uh, one of Schindler's uh, great masterpieces. Uh, it's uh, uh, characteristic of Southern California living, a small unit development with easy indoor-outdoor access. It is a bit hard to, to maintain. Uh, the Lavelle House up in Los Angeles by Richard Neutra introduces us to the next uh, a little uh, incident that I want to describe. Uh, this is Rudolf Schindler, designer of Pueblo Rivera and uh, uh, classic modernist architecture up in LA primarily. And this is Richard Neutra, who also came to Taliesin, who wanted to work with Frank Lloyd Wright. And uh, Neutra was a towering figure. I mean, physically, he was much taller than Wright. And uh, Wright resented people who were effortlessly tall. <laughs> um, and, and, and Neutra was one of these. Uh, I like to, to characterize, Wright, characterize Wright's uh, uh, behavior as being that uh, he never was able to get rid of the terrible twos. Uh, he wore elevator, elevated heels so that he would be two inches taller. He subtracted two years from his age much to the grief of his sister, so that he ended up having the same birth uh, year as his sister. She <laughs> resented that tremendously. <laughs> he uh, two-timed two wives. And uh, he, uh, if you were a creditor to him, uh, he would give you too little too late. <laughs> so it was a, a very serious problem. Well, OK, so Neutra, again, uh, uh, his, some of his first work here, the Lavelle House. These, are, they, these were both in the 20s. Some people say, well, this must have influenced Wright when he did Falling Water. But Wright was probably the greater influence because he had already done the, the so-called textile block houses in Los Angeles uh, before these buildings were built. At any rate, uh, Schindler and Neutra decided that they wanted to have an exhibit. Now, this would have been around 1930. They wanted to have a coming out uh, exhibit in Los Angeles. And so they decided that they would uh, have two portraits, one of each of them. And then uh, they would 
have a portrait of Frank Lloyd Wright as the centerpiece. And they, did, they had no idea that at the same time, Lloyd and John were talking to their father because they wanted to have an exhibit with him. And he was very uh, welcoming of that. He wanted to help them out. And so they were in active discussions about having an exhibit and, and they would have Wright's portrait and then they would have John and Lloyd's portrait to either side. So Wright was incensed that this was going on. It was without his permission. And he wrote a, uh, a diatribe to his friend Lewis Mumford in New York, the architecture critic. And Mumford, after reading the letter, it was, it was probably, uh, you know, smoking when he was reading it. <laughs> he wrote back and he said, I understand, Frank, it, it's, it's really unforgivable. But don't forget that Christ was crucified between two thieves. <laughs> okay, so the, the, the commission that was alleged to have come out of this in San Diego, and this is in La Jolla, this was alleged to have been in La Jolla, the Rosenwald School for Negro Children in 1928. And uh, the, uh, this is, uh, this, particular structure or uh, proposal or concept was attributed to San Diego because it says on the bottom in, in writing, it says San Diego, 1928. And so for years, until just a few years ago, uh, it was uh, thought that, that this was the second project that Wright had designed for San Diego that had not been built. But only recently has it been uncovered that this was for Hampton, Virginia. <laughs> And so San Diego missed out one more, on one more right project. I'm trying to give you right here, right now, and there's a question mark, remember. Incidentally, that, that design, uh, Pfeiffer thinks that that design uh, anticipated uh, some of the forms of Tellius and West, uh, Wright's compound in, in uh, Scottsdale, and uh, for those of you who may be familiar with that. It's, it's got a lot of canvas roofs that are uh, sloped at uh, a 30, 60 degree angle and that sort of thing. Now this takes us into the 1940s and this is John, John Lloyd Wright and his, uh, his first family and John had a tremendously successful practice in Long Beach, Indiana. He, he, uh, he told his daughter that a successful architect should be like the village architect or the town architect. In other words, if they want you to design the courthouse, you design the courthouse. If somebody wants a house, you design the house. If they want a tennis club, you design that. So this, his practice thrived in the 1930s. He was doing better off than his father and his brother Lloyd in Los Angeles. Well, unfortunately, uh, he did the same thing that his father did in breaking up his, his marriage. And so John left Long Beach and came to San Diego. And his first project was the Judkins residence in La Jolla. And uh, I was involved in uh, consulting on the restoration of this house about 10 years ago. And I own, if you're in the audience, uh, thank you for your help in, in finding this image. Uh, I own Stiegler was also uh, involved in, in at least uh, some of the uh, 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 initial research on the property. Where was it? Where is it? Princess Court? Yeah, I think it's Princess Court off of Torrey Pines Road. Yeah. Uh, the, the Judkins originally planned to build five houses designed by John, but that didn't happen after this house was built. This was, this was the only one. Now, we're in the 1940s, and here we mark the arrival of Sim Bruce Richards. And uh, I personally like this portrait because it is uh, an early portrait of a time when he was very intent on getting started, and you can see that in this photograph. This is the office uh, that he occupied, uh, I guess, from the early 1950s until 1978 or thereabouts. 
it's on prospect and it, it was torn down in 19, I think 78 or 79. And uh, this is uh, one of his first distinctive houses, uh, the Kohue residence. In 1948, it has a basket weave pattern. Uh, Bruce was a, a weaver. And it is unfortunate, I have to tell you, that this house is probably going to be torn down uh, sometime this, this year or next. Uh, and it's, it's a classic case of a house that has historic significance, but a succession of owners have undermined it so much that you can't find a historic fabric in it anymore. And so it's very difficult to defend holding on to it. Now this is Bruce out at a construction site. He, he always liked to pal around with the workers. And I always remember, I worked with Bruce on three or four different occasions. And one of the things I'm very fond of remembering is he used to whittle his own pencil points. Now, you know, we'd use pencil sharpeners, but he'd whittle his pencil points. And he also honed his own uh, knife blade for cutting uh, paper and so forth. And, you know, it, if you look at his houses, you can see that because everything is cut and, you know, uh, the, the fine details. He would tirelessly describe working with uh, the, uh, the great uh, leader and uh, or not working with, I'm sorry, he would talk about the great leader. He would talk about uh, the, uh, the genius who had created a written language uh, for his people uh, in one year. And he wasn't talking about Frank Lloyd Wright, he was talking about Sequoia because Sim Bruce Richards was part Cherokee and he was very proud of that. And so, uh, more often than not, he would be talking about that instead of talking about Frank Lloyd Wright. But when he talked about Frank Lloyd Wright, he was very expressive. And I remember him saying one day when he was talking about being at Taliesin in Wisconsin and the master walked into the drafting room and he would say, Bruce said, and there he stood, the great one. Well, Bruce, you know, if, if you look at, at Frank Lloyd Wright as, as being the absolute consummate Fred Astaire, which Wright would rail against that, uh, then Bruce, who would probably rail against what I'm also going to say here, was Bob Fosse. Bob Fosse couldn't do the things that Fred Astaire could do, but Bob Fosse could articulate and if you contrast the choreographic styles of the two, you'll see that, that Bruce had this clarity in his work that you don't see very often in Wright's work. One of the things about Wright is that he had all of these apprentices who would do any work for him. And so the book, the, the, a lot of his work is very fussy because he, he could afford it. He could afford to be fussy. He could have all of these people running around nailing little uh, 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 squares and cubes on his buildings. This is uh, one of the adobes. I was hoping Ione would be here because she's interested in adobes. This is a hacienda that Bruce designed in 1965 uh, for the Friedkins in Rancho Santa Fe. It's a, uh, uh, just a magnificent house. And then this is the Maguire in Borrego, which I consider to be one of, of Bruce's true masterpieces. Also of adobe. And these, uh, this photograph, the photograph of uh, the Rancho Santa Fe adobe, and this photograph of the Maguire, they're all in the book that uh, Angelus was referring to, which uh, we have for sale here. Now Lloyd Wright uh, was always trying to find opportunities in San Diego, and so in the 1950s, he met uh, a couple, uh, Mrs. Babcock, and she commissioned Lloyd to design, to design this house for uh, the south edge of Mission Valley, overlooking the valley. And I think you can see that uh, this would have been one of those tourist destination type houses. 
But it uh, turned out that the uh, cost estimate on the house went overboard a little bit. <laughs> and uh, a fellow named uh, Ken Kellogg uh, was available. Mrs. Babcock met Ken, and so she commissioned Ken to do her house. Now Ken, I would have to say, was a true optimist because when in the early 50s he was writing uh, to Frank Lloyd Wright to find out if he could uh, join the Taliesin Fellowship, his opening uh, uh, two sentences were, you don't know me, but you will. <laughs> well, he was writing that letter to an 87-year-old man, so uh, I, I think you'd have to be <laughs> pretty optimistic to, to think that you were going to get that far, but that, that was Ken. And this is a house that he designed for his in-laws, the Silva house. Uh, Ken liked to say that this is the best house in San Diego that Frank Lloyd Wright never designed. <laughs> now, uh, there's a story about a young man who graduated from Cornell. And he and a pal went to uh, visit Frank Lloyd Wright in Wisconsin at Taliesin. And uh, Wright had all of these apprentices running around after him. And, and uh, this fellow said, uh, the, the, the Cornell grad said that, that as they watched the apprentices walk around, some of the apprentices even had uh, tablets and they were writing down everything that Mr. Wright was saying. Uh, so Wright was, uh, spied this fellow and his friend, and he said, why don't you join us for dinner, and then uh, you can uh, uh, see some of the work that we're doing. Bring along some of the things you did in the meantime. So they joined Wright, and there was a big group of apprentices, and they were all sitting around, and they were looking at different work, and, and so this fellow brought out his work, and, and he told me, He's a San Diego architect, and he told me, well, my work, you know, I, I used a lot of green pencil work in my renderings. And uh, so uh, when he was finished, there was a, everybody was sitting on the edge of the bench, you know, thinking, what's Mr. Wright going to say? And, and Wright uh, looked at Alfredo Lorraine and said, you look a little green to me. <laughs> that was, that's Alfredo's house, his first house that he designed in that's in Tijuana, is it? Yeah. And uh, there's Alfredo uh, standing outside the, uh, well, the uh, we'll get to the, the funeral parlor that he designed. These, these are the twin towers that he designed in Tijuana in the 1970s, is it? Yeah. Uh, Alfredo was uh, a uh, uh, deserving of, of recognition as a true uh, skilled modernist designer. And this is the funeral uh, parlor that he designed in Tijuana. This, this was in the 1980s, okay. Uh, he designed the pavilion at the, at the, uh, what? Chicano Park. Chicano Park, yes. Um, and he was recognized for that within the last couple of years, I think. And this is a house that he designed that's out in Boulevard. And I just, you know, it, it just knocks me flat. Uh, this is a, a, just a bold, uh, crisp statement. This brings us to uh, Fred Liebhart. Fred was an apprentice at uh, Taliesin with Frank Lloyd Wright. I worked with Don Goldman. It was Liebhart, Fred Liebhart, Liebhart Weston and Goldman. I, I worked with Don. Don is one of the greatest architects that I've worked with who was not influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright. And uh, Fred was, uh, his office was one of the liveliest environments I've ever been in. They just, they just had so much fun. This is the house that he designed that Mimi uh, now lives in. Uh, it was, uh, it's done in the, in the desert stone kind of uh, work that 
that uh, Fred Learn picked up at uh, Taliesin. Now, I, I have a little story about Fred. Uh, when he joined the staff there, John Howe was the, the uh, chief draftsman for Wright, and Fred was promoted almost instantly to work with John. So Fred was a highly skilled draftsman. You don't get into that kind of assignment there unless you are good. Uh, but even at that, Fred was having problems one day with the designing of a, of a certain column uh, for the, the um, cabaret theater at Taliesin West, and he couldn't get it solved. And uh, so John went to Frank Lloyd Wright and he said, Fred's having a lot of trouble with this uh, column that you designed. Um, can you do anything for him? And Wright said, sure we can. And he walked in and he re redesigned the column, eliminated all the complications, and he said, okay, Fred, take it from there. <laughs> Fred's work is uh, very distinguished in the fact that you, you can't really identify a, a, a repeating kind of Taliesin influence. You could, you, his work was, uh, had extraordinary breadth, and he designed with his firm uh, the um, animal park, the wild animal park in 1972 is when it opened. Uh, Charlie Faust, uh, who worked with the zoo for 30 years, was uh, very much involved as a consultant on this. And there's the old Wagasa bush line. That was the train that used to run through the uh, wild animal park. And the uh, board at the zoo uh, was trying to get a name for this train. You know, was it going to be the, the jungle train or, or the choo-choo or the gorilla choo-choo? What, what were they going to come up with? And Charlie Faust walked in to Fred's office one day and he said, I know what we'll call it. We'll call it the Wagasa Bush Line. And everybody in the office, what, what, Wagasa, where did you get that? I mean, Wagasa? And, uh, so uh, Charlie said, yeah, it's who gives a shit anyway? <laughs> Fred immediately signed on as an unindicted co-conspirator, and they lobbied fiercely for the name, and that's the name that they used on this train for what? I guess they just changed it five years ago, so that's 30 years. It was called the Wagasa Bush Line. Well, that was Fred. Do you, do you know who did that mural? No, I don't. The, the question was, did I know who did the mural, and I don't know. Now, there was the one more project that was, this was designed for San Diego. And this is Harvey Fergatch's house that was going to be built on the south side of Mount Helix in La Mesa. And uh, he, he commissioned it in 1959. Wright died that year. And so Harvey lost interest in it. And it was never constructed. Wright often had designs that he kept trying to, to sell to one client after the other. In this case, the Fergatch house was based on the Jester residence, which was designed, originally designed in 1938. And uh, the, in that case, the client uh, refused to build it as well. So finally, Bruce Brooks Pfeiffer, uh, a Wright apprentice, uh, built this house, which is derivative of the Fergatch house, which is derivative of the Jester house, which incidentally had nine different versions. Uh, he, he finally built this house in 1972. John Lautner is an architect influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright who designed a residence that is in Coronado Keys. Keys or K's? K's. K's, okay. Now, John was a particularly interesting character. If you asked him to be a gentleman, he would be. But you had to ask him. <laughs> uh, I attended several of his talks and he uh, would really get on tirades and just uh, uh, start uh, cussing uh, uh, about other architects and so forth. So when I was g going to moderate a panel between Ken and John, I didn't want to have to be the referee breaking, the, breaking up, well I guess I did break it up, uh, uh, 
the, the, the uh, feud or anything. So I, I told John, I said, John, we need to hear you, but we don't need to hear you in that way. And he was a perfect gentleman. This is the uh, a house that he designed up in Los Angeles at Silvertop. And it's, it's characteristic of the majority of his uh, work after 1970. Sweeping architecture. And then, you know, we get back to this idea of do, do architects make history or are architects history? And you know, one of the things that is true is that modernist architects did not think that they were a style. And if they had been, had any inkling that they would be regarded as, well, that's an, you're an alternative to, you know, neoclassicism or that sort of thing, they would be out incensed. But the neoclassicists were just upset with modernists because they regarded modernists as these big gorillas that came in and destroyed <laughs> the traditional things. So it, it, it's an interesting contrast of, of uh, where we are today in terms of uh, there is no general consensus anymore on what constitutes a modern style. I have to make reference here to Jim Hubble because Jim joined Ken Kellogg and Sim Bruce Richards in putting together with me a, an exhibit that I presented up at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo in 1965. And this was the this this was a small exhibit, but it had a lot of energy in it. And uh, you, you see in the, in the middle there, there's a photograph of one of Ken's projects. Uh, Jim came up and, and did the, uh, the uh, muslin, uh, what, is that a stalactite or a stalagmite? I forgot. And uh, that's for Cynthia. That's, that's so that she knows what I looked like uh, 45 years ago. But it was by doing these exhibits that I, I became friends with most of the people who influenced me strongly. And so now I'm going to show you some of the things that I worked on. In 1971, I was hired by a firm. Uh, you, you probably, if you'd had me as a speaker tonight and this had been built, probably Angelus would have walked up and said, and I want to introduce you to the notorious <laughs> Spencer Lake. Uh, because I was working with another firm and they were trying to get uh, a condominium built on the flanking side of the La Jolla Country Club on that steep slope there. And uh, the, they, they had their designers look at it and, and the, their designers came up with a big block here and a big block here. And for some reason, uh, they realized that that was a non-starter. So they came to me. I, I was working in production and uh, presentation. And they came to me and they said, Spencer, uh, we'd just like you to take a shot at it. And I said, why do you want to build on that slope? <laughs> and they said, well, look, it, it's a prime piece of real estate. I said, OK, well, well, we'll see what it looks like when you can do something that, that might at least follow the contours. So this is a 54 unit con condominium proposal. It's called a project because it didn't get built. And if it had gotten built, I would have been notorious. <laughs> this is another project that involved uh, uh, condominiums. Uh, this is the Talmadge Canyon. And, and uh, in 1981, an architect had desi designed a, a scheme to develop Talmadge Canyon. It was private land. And they were going to bulldoze the whole canyon. And so the Talmadge Canyon Community Association came to me and they said, Spencer, uh, we've got to come up with an alternative to what that architect is doing in order to get the city council to vote a continuance so that we can at least get more time to try to negotiate this thing. So I designed this scheme. They gave me the contours. I had, I, I had photographs of the canyon and I designed this scheme in three days and it got the continuance, and it saved 40% of the canyon. No, not that scheme, no. No, the architect who saw that scheme, when he told me later, he said, Spencer, when I saw your scheme unveiled, I said, 
Ah, shh. I was a member of the board of directors of the uh, San Diego County League of Conservation Voters for nine years. And uh, one of the things that I was very vocal about was the multiple species conservation plan, which was adopted by the County Board of Supervisors as and is in place in, in the county. And it establishes corridors and safe zones for uh, wildlife in San Diego. It's one of the most advanced such plans in the United States. When uh, Donna Fry left uh, the League of Conservation Voters Office of Vice President, I was elected to that office for a year. And I think we, we switch to the next carousel, please. <coughs> One of the things that has been uh, constant for me is that whenever Richard Louvre or Carol Olton, is Carol here? Uh, um, or um, any of the uh, uh, K. Kaiser, uh, uh, any of the other uh, uh, writers, architecture writers, needed information about Frank Lloyd Wright, they'd call me. And, you know, I, I, I got to, to thinking, well, the best thing to, to do is to finally show you that looking for Frank Lloyd Wright in San Diego is like going to Area 51 or Roswell. <laughs> because he doesn't have anything built in San Diego. I keep getting, Welton Jones would call me and say, we think we've spotted a Frank Lloyd Wright building in San Diego. I said, no, no way. Well, okay, I want to lead in with this sort of science fiction because this is H.G. Wells' Invisible Man. Now we've been on the time machine, now we're in uh, the Invisible Man, why? Well, I am an architect who has been uh, on call, sort of the Sim Bruce Richards house doctor. And I have remodeled or extended or preserved or conserved many, many Sim Bruce Richards houses. This is one of them in Del Mar. When I approach this kind of work, I try to understand what the fabric of the interior is and work with that. I try without, humil without a sense of humiliation, I try to offer a graceful interlock with the architect who is before me. And so this house sort of laces together like a weaving. The client was just a wonderful client. Most of the clients that I've worked with who have Richard's houses are wonderful clients. And uh, she wanted to have a house that had complete repose. Well, this house, this house was submitted for AIA award. And Rob Quigley was on the jury. And they selected this house for an award, which I thought was great. But then I, I was unable to at attend the ceremony. And I heard that Rob had written and also said that my work had been done as if by the hand of an invisible architect. And I thought, my, that's, that's really wonderful. You know, it's great. And then I thought, no, it isn't. <laughs> because you, you can't get anywhere as an invisible architect. <laughs> You're the invisible man. So uh, uh, I, I had mixed feelings about that. But this is a, a, another uh, house in La Jolla the Keogh Sarnoff residence, they also wanted to remodel the kitchen and a bathroom and, and uh, do a, a laundry room addition. Where is that located? This is on Moon Ridge. Mm -hmm. And again, what I did is I, I took the roof line and I broke it in order to make it subordinate to the main house. And this is the Quintana residence, and I consider it the original house, I consider to be another one of Bruce's masterpieces. So it was a great privilege to work on this. And this is the kitchen. Nice little island there. This is the Lopresti house, another fine Sim Bruce Richards uh, residence. The, uh, ba uh, excuse me, the, the kitchen remodel. Here's a little bit of extra uh, on the living room. That's a, a wonderful 
interior. It flows. And this is a uh, carport that I did for another Richards client. The, the uh, original uh, parking structure, which was not designed by Sim Bruce Richards, burned in the Cedar Fire. And so uh, this is the Richards house back here, and this is the carport. I folded the roof up out of the ground <coughs> to make it more uh, organic, more integral to the site. This is a trellis that is also uh, ad adjacent to the house that I designed. Again, the idea is to, is to let Bruce sing. And this, the, the, I made a conscious decision to slope with the slope of the property so that the, that the roof does not create a superior mass against the house. Now the La Jolla Light mentioned falling water and, and I wasn't going to talk about falling water but since they put it in the newspaper with a big picture, I thought I'd talk to you about water falling because this is a house I designed for, for Crown Point in, in 1988. It wasn't built, it's a project. Uh, the owners were receptive to the idea of creating uh, a mountain out of a house and so the water falls over the house. The house doesn't suspend itself over the water. I have worked as a consultant. This is Elizabeth Wright Ingram. She is Frank Lloyd Wright's granddaughter. Uh, probably the second female architect to be licensed in the state of Illinois. And this is the house that uh, she designed. I did all of the construction documents for it. This is interesting because we were out on the site one day and we were talking to the owners about what was the likelihood of this house surviving on into to time, you know, the time, uh, timelessness. And about that, about that moment, we heard a loud crash and 600 feet away, there was a lot of, of dust up in the air. And we, well, we thought that it wouldn't last uh, <laughs> for 3,000 years. Excuse me? No, this is in Colorado Springs. Pueblo, Colorado, excuse me. The uh, peak temperature is 120 during the summer and it uh, gets to minus 20 uh, in the winter time. So it's really quite a, a castle. Now this is another house. Uh, this is uh, our house on Mission Boulevard. Uh, we had graffiti artists who uh, uh, fooled around with the fence. So what we did is we basically took their graffiti and then we made our own. <laughs> Uh, this is Michael Filipponi standing off to the side when I christened the house with champagne. Michael uh, runs a firm that does permit work and he's very good at it. I think he's here tonight and uh, he can solve a lot of problems for people with permits. The house is metropolitan and uh, it's also to me, to me, it has the sense of, you know, those are solar tubes, but they're also like grain silos, and we harvest the sun. This is a granny flat that uh, I designed in Ocean Beach. I think this is a very serious type of commission. Uh, I think that a lot of families are going to have to invest in this kind of design and I, I'm uh, uh, very uh, interested and I like to get involved in this kind of problem solving. You have, to be, you have to think like you're in a Pullman car going back a few years. They don't design them that way anymore. You know, the, the, all of the real compact things. I, I love it. It's a, it's a different version of a... Of a, a, a kind of a stream, uh, an Airstream trailer. Uh, this is very important. I wanted you to meet David Wright. Meet David Wright. He's, he is uh, uh, or was Frank Lloyd Wright's fourth uh, son, fourth child I should say, his third son. Uh, David was a 
a man of tremendous uh, experience in the field. He, he worked on the Hetch Hetchy Dam in California. Uh, he was in World War I. Um, and then uh, when he came to Arizona, he wanted his father to, des to design a house for him. And this was the house that, he, that his father designed. Probably the most unusual house I've ever been in, and I've been in a lot of unusual houses because I've been in a lot of Frank Lloyd Wright designs. Where is this? this is in Phoenix, Arizona, just below Camelback Mountain. Now David and Gladys, I became friends with them, and I visited them regularly for eight years while he was alive, and then I visited Gladys for eight more, so I knew her for 16 years. This is their living room. <clears throat> this carpet is world famous. This carpet has been photographed more than some classic modernist houses have been, than, have been photographed. The kitchen, very compact. And there's Gladys. David died in 1997 at the age of 102. Gladys died in 2005 at the age of 104. They were both very lucid up until their last years. Uh, well, David, his last year, I believe, uh, Gladys until about the last 18 months of her life. And uh, they were wonderful. They were just wonderful, gracious people. And the notice for this that went out said that I was de dedicating this talk to Liz Marshall. Uh, wonderful human being and a, a real champion for the arts. And she knew some of us in the audience here and she, she was a real booster. And uh, here she is with uh, Jim Hubble uh, admiring the work that he's doing on uh, a window. That, I think this is up uh, the, uh, the original Silva house that Sim Bruce Richards designed in Point Loma. But Liz was somebody who is unforgettable and will always be an inspiration every time I think of her, and I know every, every one of us thinks of her. Uh, San Diego could do with a few more Liz White people. The book is for sale here. It, uh, it uh, has been on the market for $50. I'm offering it at discount through the Historical Society for 35, uh, and a portion of that goes to the Historical Society. So, if you want to get the the, uh, as far as I know, the only book extant on Sim Bruce Richards right now, this is it. And this is Pete Guerrero. He was Frank Lloyd Wright's photographer. Pete's still around, and uh, he's Mexican American. And I, I oftentimes would. Uh, joke with him. He's, he's quite uh, uh, saucy. And um, uh, during the time when Arizona was uh, passing all of the legislation to, you know, um, uh, have ID cards and all of that, I was giving him a rough time. And uh, so he got kind of fed up with me and he said, uh, his, his last retort uh, to me was, uh, Spencer, there are two kinds of lakes. There are natural lakes and there are damned lakes. And you're the most natural damned lake I've ever known. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. I attended uh, a lecture of Frank White Wright's grandson a few years ago. I thought, and I could be mistaken, but I thought he mentioned that his grandfather was considered and was thinking about designing UCSD campus. Do you have any, have any knowledge on that? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, the question is, uh, was Frank Lloyd Wright commissioned or was he under consideration to, to design any uh, buildings for the uh, UCSD campus? The answer is no. Uh, but. Lloyd Wright, Eric's father, was commissioned by an outfit that was a, essentially a private entity that was working with UCSD to provide student housing. 
and Lloyd uh, worked with them on two uh, sites. One was UCSD and the other one was a campus up in Los Angeles. Neither of the, of the concepts was built, but I looked for a photograph of the model for the UCSD uh, student housing that he designed. Uh, I know I've got it someplace, but I'm sorry, I couldn't find it. Really beautiful. Lloyd uh, just uh, had no luck with his San Diego opportunities. It just didn't seem to work out for him. <laughs> that is the opening. <laughs> you can go on, no. Any more questions? Yes? Um, I'd like to preface this with I'm a student of history. I really respect history. That's why, except for the little guy that just left here in front of the youngest person in this room. But, um, you mentioned before about these historical houses that are being torn down or people are fighting to keep them and you mentioned one that, that doesn't have a lot of historical, uh, I don't want to say value, but uh, you know, uh, original parts to it. Fabric, yeah. Thank yeah. You. Um, but really, what I'm wondering is that I'd like to hear your thoughts on on some of these houses that, that are still around that, that might not have a lot of fabric. I mean, what do you think about tearing them down to give younger architects who may be the next Frank Lloyd Wright the chance to build in a place like La Jolla? Because building in you know places that don't have as much notoriety doesn't give you a lot of opportunity for publicity. So I, I'd just like to use the talk about that. Well, there's a tug of war in that regard. Uh, Sim Bruce Richards probably would not be entirely sympathetic to preserving everything. I mean, he didn't, he didn't fight uh, when they were going to tear down the office building that he was in, that, that uh, shingle uh, kind of uh, structure. Uh, it's, it's controversial. I mean, uh, the problem with the Kohu, as I expressed it, is that uh, it's a, a death by a thousand cuts. And the other side of this is that if you get to a point where you have paved over or, or uh, bulldozed a lot of your significant history, where is your memory? And I have a lot of concerns about that. And, and you know, that's a very ethereal question. I mean, how does a house necessarily evoke, a, a, you know, the the framing of memory for for people. Uh, I, that, you've just asked a question that could take three hours of discussion and we still wouldn't have an answer. It does bring up one thing though, which I've been mindful of. It's I mind. Uh, I'm, I've been do, working on this idea that I could work on software. It would be called I mind and you would buy it and it would do your thinking for you. <laughs> And uh, you could buy it at any uh, store that offered, uh, you, you know, sold better thinking. <laughs> so you wouldn't have to rely on any of that yourself. Uh, Lewis Sullivan, incidentally, uh, he made uh, a comment, uh, I guess that would be almost 90 years ago, that information is not knowledge and knowledge is not wisdom. T.S. Eliot wrote a poem uh, in 1934 that evokes that same thought. And so this, this kind of, of association, one of the reasons that I took Angeles up on her offer here to speak, this is important. I mean, your question is important, but if you want to hold on to these things, you have to have a, a community of association. You have to be involved and you have to, to be uh, educating your youngsters on the significance of history. Otherwise, uh, unfortunately, there's a disproportion in terms of what's being torn down and what's re replacing it. The house I understand that's going to replace the Kohu house is a 12,000 square foot house. Now I grant you that a Frank Lloyd Wright might surface who does that 12,000 square foot house. But I am influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright, and I can tell you that I'm more interest, right, interested right now in the granny flat. Now, that makes me, I suppose, very unusual. 
but I have been involved in, in smaller projects and I think that I find my greater satisfaction with that. Another question? I guess that's it. No more questions. Well, <laughs> <laughs>